Well, uh, welcome to church today. I got some props, show and tell today. I thought I'd bring in uh, two of my favorite surfboards to surf on. Uh, one of them is this uh, new Black Box 3, which I got recently. It's a uh, super fun board for surfing, great waves on. And the other is this uh, eight foot two, fat, soft, long, uh, foamy. And uh, foamies, you'll know, are the funnest boards to surf on in the world. Anyone got a foamy? Here, I convinced Ben Waterhouse to get one last year when I um, took his kids for a surf. But um, uh, uh, this year, um, I've been surfing on both of them, and I want to tell two stories about surfing on them. Um, so about uh, in the July school holidays, we went up to Byron Bay and Lennox Head, which is one of Australia's best surfing spots, this right-hand point break off this mountain just north of Ballina. Amazing surf spot, uh, best, best, you know, one of the best places in the world to surf, and we got it absolutely firing. They're just, this was one of the days, uh, huge from aqua bumps were up there, and he got some photos. It was big, it was serious. Everyone who surfs at Lennox Head, they all rip, and um, if you've got to contend as you get, go out there, you've got to contend with all of these things going on. You'll notice that there's this hill. Um, kind of that you watch the surf from. So you've got all these spectators that are watching you. And you walk down this hill and it was wet and muddy and you kind of don't want to slip as you walk down the hill. And you get to these boulders. You'll notice the whole, um, the whole breaks around. And you've got to jump off these boulders into these six-foot sets that are coming through. You don't want to look like an idiot. You don't want to stuff up and end up on Kook Slabs, which is this Instagram uh, little channel uh, that pays out surfers who absolutely kook it, right? And then you paddle out into the lineup and you're constantly thinking, where do I sit? Am I better than that person? Could I paddle around that person and snake a wave off them? Are they better than me? What happens if I get up and I fall off and there are all of these people watching me? And then this is like the best surf I've ever surfed in. So you're like, Toby, don't screw this up. Like you're never gonna get a wave like this ever again. And all of this, is going through my mind. And when that's going through your mind, you can't stop thinking about yourself, can't stop thinking about what others are thinking of you, you can't stop judging what other people are doing because they're getting all the waves. When that's your life and that's your surfing, it makes for a very tiring uh, and difficult surf. Compare that to a month or a month and a half ago Went, up the, um, went on a camping trip with some mates up the coast to a place called Treachery. And um, uh, we're camping by the beach, went out surfing in the morning, there were a couple of waves, and then it just went absolutely flat, very small waves. And so I was surfing on this, and then I went to my foamy. And it didn't care that the waves were small, didn't care that I was trying to hang 10 on this board, looking like an absolute goose. We were just having fun. Each of us would take off on the same wave, would be high-fiving on the wave, would be trying to jump onto each other's board. And it didn't, didn't matter that we looked absolutely stupid. We were having fun. And that's what a foamy does. I got some amazing waves at Lennox Head, but I don't know whether I'd say I had a great surf. I got zero good waves at Treachery but I had a great surf. And I think the, the, the challenge of surfing is to take the attitude of surfing a foamy and apply it to surfing a shortboard at a great spot. Not to be so consumed by what's going on for me, what are other people thinking of me, but just to enjoy yourself. Now, when we often think about humility, we often think of a very dreary virtue. We know we need it, but we don't expect it's going to be very much fun. It's like going to the dentist. But um, C.S. Lewis, he said the opposite. He said to even get near humility, even for a moment, is like a cold uh, glass of water to a man in the desert. Or it's like surfing a foamy with a bunch of mates on a camping trip up the coast. That's what humility gives you. Tim Keller calls humility, he says that there's nothing more relaxing than humility. 
where you're not taking yourself so seriously. At the end of every year, we do a vision series. And so this is the start of the vision series. And we think through what is the kind of church that Jesus wants us to be? And usually, we we look at kind of the five M's of our church. If you don't know what I'm talking about, come along to on board. But we look at the five M's, but we interpret them in light of one of our values. And in the past, we've done joy and worship and connection. But this year, we're taking the value of humility. What would it look like if we were a humble church? It wouldn't be, we, um, although it looks like we're at the dentist, or all these parts, it wouldn't be like a trip to the dentist. It'd be like a camping trip with a bunch of mates that you don't care whether you're, you know, hanging 10 and falling off. That's the kind of church that we want to be about. And this week, we're starting with humility before God, because this is where it all begins. Humble worship. And there's probably no better place to go than Luke 18, where we meet two men, one humble, one proud, and they both come to the temple to pray. One comes and approaches God in a proud way and the other in a humble way. So we're going to think about, well, what does humility before God look like? And these two men will teach us. So if you've got your Bible, open it up, and we're going to look at the proud and then the humble man. The proud man. Here's what, Jesus, here's what happens. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, morally, these two men couldn't be more different. The Pharisee in his day, I know to be called a Pharisee today is an insult, but in that day, uh, the Pharisee were the reform movement in Judaism. They were the guys that you wanted to babysit your kids if you needed a babysitter. You'd call one of them. They were moral, they were upright, they were generous, they cared about marriage. Uh, they, uh, they, they wanted to contribute to society. And I, I know we look down on them because Jesus doesn't stop criticizing them, but morally, these are the good guys. Morally, if you had the choice between a tax collector and a Pharisee to babysit your kids, I know which one I'm going to choose. Get to choose the Pharisee. Uh, But then there's a tax collector, and a tax collector is not the modern equivalent of someone who works for the Australian Taxation Office. The tax collectors in the ancient world, they were traders. Rome had occupied Palestine and, and imposed very oppressive taxes. The idea that was that if you were an occupying force, the more tax that you would extract, the less money they would have to be able to build up an army. And the tax collectors were Jews who went to their own people and extorted them for money, became incredibly rich in order that the Romans would have a better position in ruling their country. And so the tax is, they're scum. They're absolute scum. And these two men come to the temple to pray, and they come with a very different approach to God, which is kind of understanding if you understand their morality. Notice verse 11, the Pharisee stood by himself... And prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. Now, there's no indication that he's lying here. So when, we, when G- Jesus is criticizing this guy, but he's not criticizing him for, for lying, he's telling the truth. He is incredibly generous. He gives a tenth of all he gets. He fasts twice a week. He is, he is, uh, he, he is devoted. Uh, and he's not a robber, evildoer, or adulterer. He's not like other men. He is morally in a class by himself. But his whole, that, that's his mor- morality, but his whole approach to God, what you might call his worship, the way he faces God is completely different. I want you to notice three quick things. Notice that he stands by himself and prays, which almost certainly means he stood away from everyone else, moved away from the crowd, possibly closer to the altar, 
probably closer to the center, closer to where God is, and he's getting himself away from everyone else, and you can see that almost certainly, physically, he's acting out what he thinks about himself. I am better than others, and this is the way he approaches God, by comparison. Second thing, notice that he starts by saying, God, I thank you. So he starts with thanksgiving, which is good, but if you were to write a thank you letter or email to someone, you're going to say thank you and then list all the things that they have done that you're thankful for. But notice when this guy says thank you, he says, God, I thank you. And that's the last mention of God. (laughs) He says, God, I thank you that. And then he lists all of these things about himself. I thank you that I, 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 I. He is puffed up with his own morality. He approaches God. He approaches worship as a proud man, trusting in his own righteousness. He, here is astounding self-worship. He thanks God for what he has done, not thanking God for what God has done for him. There's the veneer of God-centeredness because he's saying, I'm obeying you, I'm doing all of this for you. But he's absolutely adoring himself. And then notice he says, I thank you. Uh, It's not, not just a list of his achievements, but it's a list of his achievements in comparison to others. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. So here is the basis of his confidence before God. I'm not like them. God, I thank you that I'm not like them because that means you accept me. And this man is in for a rude shock. God doesn't accept the person who places their confidence in their approach to God based on their own morality, their own life, and by comparing, I'm better than other people. This man was better than other people. But Jesus says that's not the way to approach God. He is what you might call a proud man. Now, the word pride in the New Testament, we're going to look at this over and over in the next uh, couple of weeks, but the word pride in the New Testament is not the normal Greek word hubris. You know the word hubris? That word, hubris has made its way all the way into English, but that's the normal Greek word that you'd use to describe pride. But in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul chooses a different word to describe this man's attitude, and it's the word phys- uh, physio. And it means to be swollen, to be inflamed, to be overinflated, to be... Um, to be distended, to be, to, be, uh, to, be infl- to be bigger than, to be puffed up. And you know, when you read the New Testament, you read Paul saying, don't be puffed up. That's, that's the normal word for pride in the New Testament. And it's an interesting and evocative kind of a picture. Um, last, I've been having this ongoing problem with my heart, and last week I had another recurrence of this condition called pericarditis. And it's when the, uh, the, the heart sits in this sack, and it's when the sack gets inflamed, usually through a viral infection or something like that. And it hurts. It, 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 it inflames, and, and it puts pressure on the heart, and so you get a lot of chest pain. And that's the word that's being used here. It, it means to be inflamed, to be extended, distended, swollen, ready to burst, extended beyond its proper size. Now, if that's the word, what might that mean for us? Well, four things, and I got this from Tim Keller's helpful book, uh, The uh, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. But here's four things. We're looking at pride. Four things. One, empty. The ego, or the sense of self that is puffed up and overinflated, proud, uh, has nothing at its center. If you blow up a balloon, it's big, there's nothing at the center, well, there's oxygen, right? So if you're a scientist, you gotta disagree with me, but there's nothing at the center. And spiritual pride is the illusion of uh, that we are competent to run our lives, that we are competent to bring a recommendation before God for ourselves. 
It searches for something that will, uh, pride searches for something that will give us a sense of worth, a sense of specialness, a sense of purpose, and we build our life on that. For this man, it was his religious observance. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of all I possess, and it's his sense of comparison, I'm better than him. And he builds his, but all of us have something that we look to and you say, yeah, that's what I've got, that makes me, that's, that's what makes me who I am. But if, unless it's God, if you place it at the center and the middle of your life, it's gonna rattle around in your soul. And that's because uh, without God, you're empty. It's too small and it's gonna rattle, and this man's rattling. He's rattling like one of those old, Red rattlers on the, you know, you remember the red rattlers, the trains, you know, it's rattling, his soul's rattling, it's empty, he's, he's made something the center of his life, his own morality that actually isn't big enough to be the center. Second thing is it'll be painful, a distended, overinflated ego is painful. I wonder, you see, I, I never even noticed my pericardium until it became inflamed, uh, you know, uh, you don't notice a part of your body until there's something wrong with it. We don't walk around and we're not usually thinking about how fantastic our toes are or how fantastic our elbows are. They're just elbows, they're just toes, but they hurt when there's something wrong with them. Our ego hurts constantly. Our sense of self hurts all the time. And that's because there's something wrong with it, something unbelievably wrong. It's, we're always drawing attention to itself. It's always making us think about ourselves, how we look, how we're treated, what other people are thinking about ourselves. People sometimes say that um, their feelings are hurt, but feelings can't hurt. They react to our sense of self getting hurt. Our ego gets hurt. You know, walking around doesn't hurt our toes unless there's something wrong with them. And our ego, our sense of self, would not hurt unless there was something terribly wrong with it. And it is hard to get through any day without feeling snubbed or ignored or feeling stupid or getting down on ourselves. And that's because there's something wrong with the way we view ourselves. We're never happy, we're constantly drawing it. That's pride. Third thing is, so it's empty, uh, it's like a bloated stomach that's inflamed. Secondly, it's painful. Thirdly, it's busy. It's always drawing attention to itself. That's what pride does. It's always trying to fill the emptiness with something and directing other people to see it. And as a result, it's always comparing and boasting. He stands at a distance, comparing himself to others, does this Pharisee. I'm better. I've got something that ought to fill my life with a sense of I'm okay. And he does that through comparison and by boasting. I thank you that I'm not like other people. And that's the normal way you try and fill your sense of self with a sense of, no, I matter. And we do that all the time. You know, C.S. Lewis points out that pride by its nature doesn't stop comparing. Let me quote him. He says this, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next person. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but they're not. They're proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. In other words, we're only proud of being more successful, more attractive, more intelligent than the next person. And when we're in the presence of someone who is more successful than us, more intelligent than us, we lose all pleasure in what we had. That's what pride does to us. It, it, it makes us uh, uh, dissatisfied, constantly busy, 
trying to fill our sense of emptiness with the fact that we're better than other people. And then thirdly, because it's empty, because it's painful, because it's busy, it's fragile. That is, because anything, that is anything that's overinflated is in, in, in imminent danger of being deflated. Uh, and if you're puffed up, you can be popped. And, um, and I think that's, that's reality. And so if you've got a, a, uh, a superiority complex or if you've got an inferiority complex, both the same. If you feel superior to others, it's because you're puffed up, you're overinflated, you're comparing yourself to others. And if you feel inferior to others, we'd say, well, that's not pride. Isn't that humility? No, 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 you're still comparing yourself to others. You're not okay and at rest with who you are. That's not humility. And so Tim Keller, C.S. Lewis, their definition of humility, which I found helpful, is it's not thinking... Um, less of yourself, that you're worse than others. It's just thinking less about yourself. It's not being preoccupied about yourself constantly. And that's this man, constantly consumed with himself. And it's painful to watch. Okay, let's come to the second man and, uh, and how he approaches God. Look down at verse 18, uh, or verse 13, sorry. Verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven while a Pharisee was commending himself. Uh, he wouldn't look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So both men stand by themselves, but this man stands at a distance and he has this intense feeling that he's not worthy to draw near to God. Whereas the Pharisee stood erect with eyes to heaven, the tax collector can't even bring himself to lift up his head. Whereas the Pharisee prays confidently about his achievements, the tax collector prays to God about his failings. And whereas the Pharisee was satisfied comparing himself to others, the tax collector merely cries out, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Not a sinner, as our translation puts it. It says, the sinner. It's as though he says, I am everything everyone says about me and more. I won't attempt to make myself better by comparing myself with someone else. I am the sinner. It doesn't matter what other people are. It, it, I don't care about their verdict before God right now. I know who I am. God, I haven't honored you as I should. I am, who cares what else is going on? Before you, God, I am the sinner. And so here we have two opposite men coming before God in prayer. And notice which man God accepts. Finally, Jesus tells us, verse 14, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified, right with God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. The gospel, Jesus, what he's come to bring us, is a hospital for the sick. None but the guilty will ever accept its benefits. It's medicine for the diseased. And the whole and the self-righteous will never relish its saving droplets. And so this is the shock of all shocks, the scandal of all scandals. The moral, respectable, honest, faithful Pharisee who I would have babysit my kids, God rejects him. And the immoral, unworthy, dishonest, unfaithful tax collector draws near to God with humility and is accepted. The Pharisee draws near to God and we think he's got every reason that God should accept him, but he isn't. The tax collector who systematically made his money off the back of his people, he's a traitor, he's a pariah, 
He casts himself on God's mercy and God accepts him. His sins are forgiven. And that's Christianity. If you don't know the gospel, that's the message of Jesus. Doesn't matter what you've done, what you've become. You come before God with an honest inventory of your life, saying to God, God, I haven't honored you the way I should have. I haven't treated my neighbor the way I should have. Will you have mercy? And Jesus loves to show mercy to humble people. This is what makes Christianity different from every other religion. Every other religion says, no, the moral are in, the immoral are out. If you want to join a political party, if you're good at side, siding with all the values of that, you're in, and if you're not, you're out. Our world constantly treats people by merit. We're a meritocracy. You get what you get uh, because of the merit, the, your, your achievements in life. But Christianity is absolutely different. Other religions say uh, the moral are in, the immoral are out. Christianity says it's not the bad who are out and the good who are in. The, the line in Christianity is the humble are in and the proud are out. All of us, we all have a problem with the idea of hell. Jesus, he talks about that. In verse 14, I tell you that this man rather than the other went home justified before God. One man is right with God and the other man is not. Jesus is saying you can be right with God or, you can't, or you're not right with God. There are only two possible options for a person in their life. And it's interesting, although we have a problem with hell, all of us have some kind of line that we would draw. If we were God and we were running heaven and hell, we wouldn't let Hitler in, Stalin in, Pol Pot in. We wouldn't let certain political leaders in to our version of heaven. What's your divide? Jesus has a line. But his line isn't good or in the bad or out. His line is simply, if you're humble enough to admit that you need mercy, you're in. And if you can't do that, you're out. Which sadly leaves many people out in this world. You know, Trump, I'm not, this isn't political. This is merely a moral evaluation of the man. You know, he said he's never prayed for forgiveness in his life. There's a man who's out. Uh, you might like his politics, great. Uh, but before God, he's a proud man who God will not, and many people in our society refuse. This is the sticking point for them when it comes to Christianity. They think it would be the sign of emotional ill health to admit such guilt before God. Is that right? Is it healthy to be burdened by such guilt that you'd come before God in worship, not being able to lift your head, but be, say, God, I blew it again. I am sorry. Is that emotional ill health? Our society tells us that that is ill health, and you need to shake off the pressure that the rest of society, the pressure that religion places on you, shake that off, be true to yourself, create your own standards and get free from guilt. But that's not true, that's living in fairyland. Here is a man who has true emotional health. He is able to look at his life objectively and say, you know what, I haven't lived up to the kind of person God wants me to be and I can name that. Can you name that? I think most people can't name that. It's too painful for them to name that. We're not used to someone so honest and aware of their moral failures, but this is humility. John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, he said there are two things which, I, which I'll, I'll, I'll remember on my deathbed. I'm a great sinner but Christ is a great saviour. If, if you only remember two, two things from this, uh, that's it, that's all you need to know. That's the, I'm a great sinner, but Christ came to save sinners and he is a great saviour. So a Christian is someone who is not puffed up or deflated. They're filled up by a sense of God's gracious love to them, a sinner. 
you reach a place where you no longer need to draw attention to yourself. When you do something wrong, you don't need to hide it. You can accept that you failed others, failed yourself, failed God, and it doesn't crush you because you know the mercy of God. And so you go to God in worship saying, God, I blew it again. Please forgive me. And you walk away justified, accepted, right with God, and as a result, thankful. Thankful. See, a Christian, a humble Christian, is not someone crushed because they know the love of God. And when you achieve something, it doesn't go to your head because you know you're still a sinner. And even your best days, you still need God's grace. I like what J.I. Packer said. He said, there is unspeakable comfort in knowing that God's love of me is utterly realistic, based at every point on the prior knowledge of the worst about me. That's how God loves me. So that no discovery now can disillusion him about me in the way I'm so often disillusioned about myself and quench his determination to bless. He sees more corruption in me than that which I see in myself. And yet for some unfathomable reason, he wants me as his friend and desires me to be my friend and has given his son to die for me in order to realize that purpose. That's a Christian. God knows more about what's going on inside me, more of my wickedness than I know. I come before God, honest. God, I blew it, fully aware that he is full of love and mercy toward sinners. That's what this story teaches us. Now, let me apply this very briefly. What would this look like? Uh, If you truly got this, if you were truly humble, Well, it'd impact the way that you treat others' moral failures, and it'd impact the way you treat your own moral failures. So let's look quickly. Here's the test of whether you've been gripped by the grace of God. First of all, how do you deal with the moral failure of other people? When they've really failed, where they've let themselves down, they've let God down, they've let their family down, or something like that. How do you treat them? If you're impatient, if you say things like, how could you have? Are you serious? Why can't you get your act together? Why can't you pull yourself? Do they sense that you understand how they could have done such a thing? Uh, that's, that's the, this is the acid test of whether you're a hump, whether you've been gripped by the grace and mercy of God yourself. How do you treat those who have failed? Because if, if that's not true of your relationship with God, that you are a moral failure before God and you're used to receiving mercy, you won't know how to treat others who fail themselves and fail God. That's the true test. Notice Jesus starts this passage, to some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else. The true test of a Christian who's been gripped by the grace of God is how you treat others who are moral failures. But then the second test is, well, how do you deal with your own moral failure? When you let yourself down, when you fall, are you devastated? And do you feel like you can't face God and you can't face others and you can't face yourself in the mirror because you've utterly failed? Well, that's a sign, if that's you, that you're still trying to save yourself. When you let yourself down, when you let people down, do you beat yourself up? Are you angry at yourself? Maybe even today, are you knocking yourself around? Do you know what that shows? That still shows that Jesus isn't your savior. You're your own savior, but your savior has let you down. You've let yourself down, and you, you're, you're upset because of that. There's nothing more despairing than that. Your real savior is in ruins. But if Jesus is your savior, if you've transferred your trust to him, he eats and drinks with sinners. He welcomes sinners. And so you'll go to him heavy with sin, but you'll walk away with the freedom of someone who's been forgiven their sin. That's Christianity. 
And that's the kind of church that we want to be. This is vision series. First week, humble before God. It affects everything else. It affects the way you view yourself. It affects the way you treat others. But it starts before God. It starts with grace and mercy. It starts with who are you? Are you a righteous person who's got your life together? Well, then Jesus has nothing for you. And he'll send you away empty. But if you're willing to admit that you are a sinner in need of mercy, then he will come to you and free you from that sin and forgive you of it, and you'll walk away thankful. Humility is right at the heart of Christianity. And if we got this, we wouldn't take ourselves so seriously. Church life would be fun, but church life often isn't fun because people are annoying. (laughs) The people around you, they will hurt you. Uh, sorry to break this to you. This isn't a perfect place. And the thing that we need to work on as a church is, are we happy? Are we able to enjoy the fact that we're in a church with people with all kinds of failures, that this place isn't what we would want it to be? But actually, I'm not taking myself so seriously and you so seriously that I actually still can't enjoy the people around me. That's the kind of church that we want to be. We want a church that takes God seriously and ourselves not so seriously, that knows grace personally and is able to share that grace with others. Isn't that what we want? Let's commit ourselves to building a church like that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this reminder today of the grace upon which we stand, the mercy upon which we stand, that you do not treat us the way our sins deserve, that coming to church isn't an exercise like this Pharisee of of demonstrating our spiritual CV before you that you might accept us, but that true worship consists of a contriteness of heart, a humility of heart, a recognition of our need. And so we come today before you recognizing our need for mercy, that we've said and done things this week that we're ashamed of and we've left unsaid and left undone things that we ought to have done. Please have mercy upon us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, his death for us that we might be forgiven And we pray that that might impact the way we treat one another. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.